Welcome to the e-commerce growth show brought to you by Segmentify. All right, all right, all right. So hello everyone. This is Carlos again with Evolve for another episode of the e-commerce growth show, Scandinavia. And today I'm joined by someone I already consider a friend and someone also highly knowledgeable in the retail arena in Scandinavia and other countries, Martin Linko. Martin, so first off, thanks very much for joining the show today. Uh, you're, you're actually joining a global network of experts and thought leaders. This show is brought by Segmentify, an e-commerce personalization software that enables online retailers to deliver unique shopping experiences to their com companies and, and, and so they can navigate in a disrupted world, which is going to be our topic today. But before we delve into it, let's start with you. Uh, and I will shut up from now on. Thank you for being here and please introduce yourself, Martin. Thanks, Carlos, and uh, thank you for bringing me on board. Uh, I saw a number of your talks, always interesting perspectives. Uh, some I share, some I might uh, challenge, but let's see as we go along. But uh, anyway, Martin uh, Lungo Simonsen, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, for most of the talks, the relevance of this is probably my work out of uh, Implement Consulting. Um, and having done consultancy for yeah, gray hair, long time, 15 years plus uh, at, um, at this time. Um, something that I'm passionate about and something that gives me energy. And I think uh, also the reason why we're talking about retail today is it that that's, you know, maybe one of the more dynamic industries and where change and high pace is, uh, is quite, uh, quite relevant uh, to our topics here. Very nice. Martin, uh, you're someone who has a very interesting past. So you were a badminton player. You, you worked in the army, uh, you were deployed in IREC, and, and, and tell us a little bit about your journey, man. So how did you come about uh, landing in retail, but what happened in the past and, and what shaped you as a, as, a, as a human being, being who works in an organization fit for humans, I think has a lot to do with you, and the company and the values that you guys uh, work for. Um, uh, you, you know, so tell us a little bit about your past and, and, and yeah, your big picture. Uh, yeah, thanks, Carlos. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, it goes back to a little bit of the passion again, you know, so I, I played badminton for a number of years as a player and, and as a coach uh, and, and truly appreciate it. I think some of my good friends, you know, they might be picking on me saying it's just because you were poor at soccer, which might be a fair challenge. But nevertheless, uh, I found myself being a lot more talented within badminton and, and pursued that for um, pursued that for many years. Uh, and I think that's kind of been driving me a lot is what I have passion around. I haven't really had a kind of, you know, a direction as this is where I wanted to get to. So my, what brought me into, into the military and, and into the, uh, you could say the realm of, of intelligence was, was a similar thing, a passion about how to work with this and a passion about how to utilize that kind of information to kind of create a difference of, of what you do. And I think when it comes to the military world, working with intelligence on one side, it's about batting the, you know, getting the bad guys. But on the other side, it, it's very much a game about keeping people safe. Mm -hmm. It's a game about doing that. So, so I think that passion around working within the army uh, took me that way, which is actually also what led me into, into my studies uh, come that because this whole idea of working with intelligence and information drove me into kind of having, you know, um, a master's around IT and economics and pursuing that line of a degree and where I think once again, you know, you find out what are you better at and, and where do you have your passion and one of my good, uh, my good friends at that time, you know, he was, you know, his ability to code, you know, was, you know, twice my pace of just doing a regular Word document. So I realized I probably have a, a better skill set of, of, you know, how to work in that, you know, intersection between digital and business. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, that I think that's what's been driving me along the way. Um, always uh, kind of stay close to the army, I still do. Uh, so you talked about Iraq, I actually did a tour to Iraq between my bachelor's and, bachelor's and, and master's. Uh, and then I, as I came back and, and, and finished my master's, uh, I, uh, I, I pursued a new line of uh, dynamic worlds. And then this is where my career in, in consulting started up. Well, what did you learn in Iraq? What's the, what's the biggest learning you had there? Um, I think a number of learnings. Uh, I, I don't think they summarize up to one. Um, I, I think some of them is, you know, when you get into a society as such where, where, where we have taken over, uh, people are more or less willing to say whatever <laughs> to make sure that, you know, they are safe and it moves in their direction. Um, 
I think what you also learn is that, you know, that kind of society and the way that it's built up. So our preconceived opinions about what's good and bad. And, you know, if you were a member of the party, you were by default bad. But when you actually get to work, you find out, you know, you don't have an option uh, being in a society of such. So I think I've learned a lot about the culture and the society and the norms and what and what is. And then, of course, I, I learned a lot about because suddenly, you know, the theoretical uh, ideas of how you work needs to be applied to reality. Uh, so, so a number of the, of the things being done at the time when we deployed in Iraq, from you know safeguarding, you know assaults, uh, from bringing information forward to the capture of some of the people. You might remember back in the in the time there was a card deck, and we were trying to pursue each of these cards to capture the ones uh, who had truly been um, uh, within the regime of, of Saddam Hussein, and uh, we were part of that uh, game as well. So okay. I think a lot of learnings from, from the basic to the cultural to the professional side of what does it actually mean to play such a significant role in a, in a society. Uh, we'll have a talk about that at some point. I, I find it fascinating. Uh, there was a, some guys I was listening to a podcast. They were talking about how to capture the bad guys. And you actually, because it's so complex, especially when you're internationally deployed and you need not, you're never really going to get the bad guys. So you need to start with a small network. So they lead you to the bad, you know, to the to the really bad guys. And and I mean, I think there's a lot of of that could be the perfect segue to to retail and the complexities in retail and and you know drawing parallels about your role today. What is it that you do to transform retail? You know, like not you, but as in they implement consulting groups and you work with a bunch of in interesting clients, and we are living in a disrupted retail world. So uh, you know, what is it that you guys are doing to help your customers navigate in such a mad, but very interesting world that we're living in. I think one of your key points, although, you know, as you phrase it here is kind of, we see ourselves as in the, in the business of helping. And I think being in the business of helping is also to kind of help these companies make the relevant choices at the relevant time, right? So, so what do I mean by that? I mean by that when, when you think about the strategy of a company and, and where you truly believe you need to move forward to be successful, there's a number of choices from which markets to, to dominate, which segments to target, which channels to, to make yourself available in, and all the way through how you want to do fulfillment, um, how you're driving your whole operational setup. And, and I think we as consultants, we need to be in the business of helping companies you know, put these choices on the table at a relevant time. So, so I think that's that's probably the first starting point of that, and that's um, and as an implement, what we do, I think we, we have a little bit of an advantage having a number of subject matter experts across the full value chain. Meaning, uh, if you want to work at the commercial end of things, and your next kind of growth lever is really truly to understand, you know, your next go to market strategy or how to update your value proposition. You know, we have people who who could look at that. But at the same time, we also know, and we've seen that, especially over the, the last five, 10 years, as e-commerce has been growing, becoming a bigger picture that your supply chain and how you run the operational side is not just an enabler, it's a true differentiator of making you relevant as a company. You know, and, and while these are maybe just two of the basics of the business model, then I think what kind of sits with that and what comes on top of that is the ability as a company to develop. So how do we act as leaders? How do we act and play the different roles that you see through a retail organization, all the way to the store employees, the store managers, the retail managers, country managers, and you know, and at the ivory tower of decisions, how do we connect and how do we make sure that everybody plays their role? So, so I think I think in essence we're we're kind of in the in the business of helping, and we need to focus in on you know what's the most important issue at a given time for a given company. And what is the most important issue today? Uh, because I mean, one of one of the talks that uh, that I, I was part of, is part of uh, the roundtable. You you speak about short term impacts, and I think there's a lot going on since you know the beginning of the pandemics. But also looking at at what's keeping CEOs up at night. Uh, you're working a lot with C CEOs, CXOs. We have a lot of trends. Uh, I mean, there's ah, it's in my bag. But I mean, there's crypto, there's blockchain, there's AR, VR. And those things, they cause anxiety because they are impacting the world, but they're kind of like hidden things that are happening. We don't really see them, but then they happen all of a sudden, right? But yeah. in terms of the uh, short-term 
actions that you're you know advising your customers what is it that they are they're actually doing now and then we speak about uh you know long-term um actions and how to look at the future as well because i think it's part of your scope there so let me maybe you know just zoom into to what we're all facing right now which is kind of this uh, covid 19 situation and i think uh i think short-term action is always relevant but i think this particular point that we talked about short-term action and long-term durability was really about that suddenly we, we kind of we were disconnected with our shoppers we were disconnected uh, in most of the countries in a way where how we used to do our normal business uh, of course that weren't true for pure players uh, who were thriving through the beginning of that but i think for most of the companies uh, being mostly physically driven or even omni companies with a big large uh, physical footprint they needed to rethink engagement so so short term action was really about saying how do we come up with new ways that are relevant to how we live right now the new dynamic of being home the new dynamic of maybe having homeschooling, the new dynamic of actually having to do your purchases in a different way. How do we deal with that short term? So what makes you know new connections, new engagements? How can I make myself relevant where we choose to spend our time? And then in those many choices we can make, if I have to prioritize between the ones I choose to implement, it's just worthwhile saying, would this initiative actually also drive long-term value? Right. So if I have to choose between these, is this just something I'm doing right now? It's kind of a bandage to sustaining my business model, or is this something that will actually do that? So, so I think it started out, you know, throughout these conversations, um, small things in social media, setting up conversations uh, relevant to to that. If that's being a conversation suddenly about how to get your gardening done or reorganize reorganizing your closets because that's what you were doing at the moment, and then positioning your products in that place, or if this became a conversation about the, the everyday luxury, which you kind of lost by not being able to go to restaurants or traveling, and then making sure that you as a retail grocer suddenly play into these, uh, these dynamics and these touch points. So I think that was, that's where the conversation started. Then I think there's a different way when we talk about this, which is more from a portfolio view of initiatives. So I think if you look at you know, the game board where we're trying to be successful, you can kind of draw two axes. And, and as a consultant, of course, we all we always like two by two. So let's see if I can kind of paint that, you know, an imaginary one here, right? So on, on one axis, we really talk about the needs. So the consumer needs being the ones we know and the ones that we're seeing kind of materialize in society and what we do. And then on the other axis, we can talk about technology. So, you know, what are the existing technologies, the mature technologies that are already in the market and kind of going upwards, uh, what are kind of these technologies that are on their way? And those two kind of, they form this two by two. And I think it's important as a company to think about where are my short-term actions? Meaning if I haven't truly managed to get these existing mature technologies put in play to what it is I'm trying to do. So this lower left corner of the matrix these are my short-term actions. Make sure that I that I move forward. But of course, it can't always be a catch-up game, right? We need to be able to leap forward and mm -hmm. kind of have a portfolio view of saying, well, you know, these new technologies, you know, if that's being, you know, a digital twin or AR or whatever is coming in, they offer a new way of creating a better business. Or if it is to kind of monitor new needs, if that's being, you know, sustainability or engagement ways that how I want to be do personalization and, and how can technology somehow create a better way of bringing that in. So I think there's also a portfolio game to be played in the short long-term view of things. Very interesting. If we are to get more granular about this, so for example, in, on, on the, some of the videos about the round table, it was quite interesting what Kenneth from Baby Sam, Baby Sam if I'm not mistaken, he said, and then you have Yusk, which is a, a behemoth in, you know, all over the world, actually, except for South America, Latin America, maybe US, I don't know if they're there, but in Europe, they're huge, right? And I think there are many ways to get to Rome, if you like. So Baby Sam uh, was taking an approach, as I understood, and maybe you can correct me, where they are taking the online shops as the core of their business and then digitizing the whole thing. Uh, the offline operation, whereas um, 
Whereas USC, it seemed that well, it's a much larger, much larger organization, uh, you know, and they but they've been very competent to 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 digitize to offer the the whole unified experience, but not really taking the e-commerce as 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 a starting point. You know, maybe can, can you can you give me some in, give us some insights there? Because yeah, so, but I think I think it's two different models in worth, and I think they have value in different. But let let me get to one another at a time. So I think. I think what Baby Sam uh, realized over time is that this dynamic, and you know, thinking about the business that they are in, you know, from kind of the zero to two or two plus years, mm-hmm. trying to really, really harvest all sales and build share wallet within those two years, and the dynamic of how it is that we actually purchase and buy for our children or our babies going forward. And I think the model that they realized is here that if you truly want to change and move forward into an, an, a unified commerce model, they wanted to kind of redo and rethink and start over and saying, let's imagine we were an online business with a physical footprint. Mm-hmm. And we've seen that early on, um, another part of, of last last the group, uh, Boje, and many others uh, started out that way, right? They started out as an online business and then they built on stores. And I think for many years, they've had the advantage of kind of growing from there. So. So the dialogue tool or whatever kind of conversation piece comes up in your point of sales is a, is the same picture across channels and it allows you to kind of have that seamless journey. And I think that's what Kenneth and his team kind of also realized. And instead of you know being stuck in what might have been the old reality, kind of leaping forward to saying, this is the new way of working. We'll kind of leap in here and we'll work backwards into creating a new, uh, a new model. Uh, and I think they're well on the way in, uh, in doing exactly that. In a business that are truly defined by the service and the, the advice that we do, because we, in a matter when we buy for our children and babies, we are all about getting the right product specifically and relevant with the right security. So, so I think that offers uh, one option. Uh, and maybe also the fact that they are, you could say, on, on the edge of, of moving outside Denmark, you know, going into the Nordic markets and whatnot, they still have an opportunity to kind of change the the business model if you're looking at use as a company uh, you have to you know you have to think about the, the fact that they have more than three thousand stores mm-hmm. uh, across the globe and, and how they operate um and and came out of being this local store close to where we are that can kind of fulfill those needs within anything you kind of needed within sleeping and living right so that's been their business model and a quite successful one um over the years but I think one thing that you just got truly good at is that is a little bit back to, you know, what are the choices we need to make and making sure you don't need to make all of them at once. Mm-hmm. So, so, so the early engagements I've had back with you at the times when you said we actually need to start by understanding our customers. So looking just short of 10 years back, they actually, you know, went out, did a huge study to reconnect with the customers and find out what were truly driving value and use that to kind of leverage their business model. And then fast forwarding a number of years, of course, the realization that this is not a singular channel anymore. It's a cross channel game, right? And it's becoming a unified commerce game driven by how we want to be served as a customer, right? So we don't care, you know, if we buy online or we buy in the physical, we care if we buy for, for, for the brand in this case, and they need to create that seamlessness. So looking three, four years back, you just made that choice and kind of, um, reinvented their IT stack and you know, changed around and, and started implementing new uh, point of sale systems and a new backend to make sure that they could actually live up and deliver. So you can say this way, they are integrating into the stores, right? So, so they've gone from having no e-commerce to having a 30 plus percent share revenue now wow. within e-commerce and continue to grow that. And now I think they're on the verge of where many retailers are of that size to create that integration, which on one side is, I'm saying, just a system integration. And then having said that, we know <laughs> that's still many companies. <laughs> and then on the other side, changing behavior, uh-huh. making sure that employees in every channel know their role specific to this channel, but also knows how to support a customer journey that moves beyond channels. And I think they've done very well in moving that journey forward. And then I think I expect to see big things coming up from uh, from use as they roll out these systems uh, in the years to come. Yeah, fascinating. And I think the amount of customer data 
that is that they, they're able to pull. I mean, we see that in Brazil, a lot of new business models. So for example, companies that are, they were traditional brick and mortar retailers, but they were able to be kind of like yuskish in their way of, uh, you know, uh, digitizing their whole operation. And I mean, they're creating marketplaces and banks. They are, you know, it's it's amazing what, what is happening in, in retail and new business models in that sense. And what what are you seeing? Maybe you can, I'm not, not asking you to tell what's uh, behind the scenes. Maybe i uh, give you a little uh, nudge there, but not just USC, but what are you seeing the, you know, in terms of, of trends, uh, Martin, for these retailers that been able to, to kind of like create a solid base, you know, understand the customer data, and then how is it that new opportunities are emerging for them? Yeah, so uh, again, there's not one straight answer to, to this. And I think the, the caveat here is what we can and are able to do with data right now are being redefined, you know, in various ways from the European Union to the US to China and whatnot. So, so, so the ability to work with data, uh, and you would say the easy answer to this is actually being irrelevant enough for your customers to opt in, for them to kind of be relevant to share the information that will make your business model stronger and you more relevant for them. So, so how do we get to that point? So, so, so what's the answer? I think the short term answer is companies who truly manage to engage us in a way where we, you know, in, in, in the early parts of that, you, you made a purchase with me, you know, please provide your email and I'll keep your uh, receipts. <laughs> to the very end of that, you know, how do they learn something about me, something about my family, something about how I live in order to be relevant? And I think those companies that manage to be relevant, if that's a newsletter or the way I see ads popping up in Facebook or Instagram, or even when I'm engaging at their e-commerce site, that it talks to me and it makes sure that, that it captures um, me and, and, and what I do. So I think those are the companies that, um, that are quite successful. So, so then yeah, of course, what you're asking also, who has been the successful ones? To be truly, I, I don't see one company which I feel has been unique across all of the different elements. I think I see different companies having been able to kind of capture parts of that and what we do. In, in essence. And I think also it has to do with, am I buying grocery for the everyday? Or am I you know, into buying my next TV, radio, car? And, and the interest that typically sits with that kinds of, um, that kinds of, of purchase. Um, so I think the learning experience here is, is uh, unique. And the data that you sit on, the gold for making your next choices, truly deals with the fact of being relevant uh, for, for customers. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's it's really interesting, man. Uh, so, so, for example, what what we are talking about is relevance, and in order to be relevant, well, yeah, you need to to process that data, but also storytelling, right? Storytelling, personalization, and uh, my opinion is that the companies that uh, well, first they need to understand the customer, but tell good stories. Uh, you, you know, across sure. my journey, right? They are. Uh, I, I don't like the the term. Winner, winners and losers, but they're the ones who are going to probably stand out more and stick, be more sticky, if you like, right? True, true. So, so I think if, if we bring in a few good examples, I think one company that has been driving a lot and, and it was inspired me over the years are a company like Nostrum. I think the way that they're able to kind of uh, tell stories and, and connect with their audience are, are quite unique. And, and it's been something where I somehow feel associated with who they are as a business and how they conduct their business, right? So, so let me get back to storytelling because I think there's a unique part, but on the back side of that, right? So, so again, why have they been successful? Well, they've been sex successful because they've told the stories and they've kind of created the awareness and traffic that made them relevant to you know, what we were in the market to buy. But then they've also designed a business model that allows me to engage with them in a different way. So if you look at how Nordstrom conducts their business today, it's early engagement through social media, right? And it's, it's even the way social media has developed, the channels have de developed. You can do your point of sales within those social media. You can also go from one social media and directly in with captured information to their e-commerce side, where you can go more into depth with what they have for offer and that. And then when I want to do my fulfillment, I can still make a choice. Do I just want to get this shipped to my home or do I want to go into the closest department store and pick up what I need? So, 
I think they've managed to do both storytelling and create a business model that delivers a seamless uh, experience. I think, uh, of course, Apple, from a storytelling point of view, I think they've managed to do something that are, that are quite unique. Um, if you kind of buy into what they offer and how they do it and, and how they build it, and this is just not Simon Sinek, uh, you know, giving a story about, you know, their ability to storytell, but I think they've created a narrative around who they are as a brand and what they offer as a brand that you, that you also buy, uh, buy into. Um, I think, you know, maybe one of the more extremes, uh, maybe Patagonia, if you're looking yeah. at their ability to, uh, to do storytelling, again, you know, they're targeting a specific market and, and some, you know, might argue if you do the analysis across markets, maybe to a more narrow part of the market, mm -hmm. which truly, you know, identifies themselves with the distinct values that they have to offer. But the fact and the way they go to market, right, you know, so the best piece of clothes is the one already made. Right, so they're trying to sustain a business in the market. And I think the storytelling talks to us as consumers if we share the same value, but it equally talks to employees wanting to connect themselves and see this. And I think, I think that as a driving force, the ability to storytell your values plays an equally important role to the shoppers and customers that we want to win, but also to the employees we want to attract and retain uh, as our business. Mm -hmm. How about the role of experience then? Because you mentioned Apple there, I'm reading a book, really nice, and I'm not sure if you read it. It's by Joseph Pine. It's called The Experience Economy, right? And then the whole the whole premise and theory, that, and I mean, it's unbelievably interesting because he talks about, for example, Apple being able to, it's not, you know, like, um, I'll talk to you about evolving what I'm, what's cooking, but my realization that is, I mean, there's so much technology in the world, but we need to understand how to apply the technology and we need the experiential people who, who's got the vision, who, you know, who can connect stuff and then create a nice experience, whether it's like a 3D, 3D model. I spoke with a guy recently who who've been de deploying or launching a um, uh, fantastic guy. Uh, this, this, you know, not Marvel, but Disney, Disney uh, projects across the globe. And then he talks about the, the whole experience economy that we live in and how, why Disney invests so much in, in experiences. And all of that is part of retail, right? And it's, sure. we, we, we talk so much about tech when there's actually something bigger here. And I, I would love to, you know, to have your views on it. Yeah, I think just if you're coming back at Joseph Pine, I think his model of the, the progression of economic value. So his idea of, of time well saved and time well spent, I think offers a unique story. And for the ones who, you know, where he talks about the, the progression of coffee, right? Mm -hmm. He talks about the, yeah. the fact that we are willing to, you know, pay a few cents to the dollar on the coffee beans. If someone kind of roasts this, package it up, you know, price increases. If someone's willing to brew that and put that in a cup, it increases. And then, you know, suddenly someone calls it the third home, puts a logo on it, story tells that we are willing to throw six, seven, ten dollars at Starbucks from, from a cup of coffee. And so, so I really like, and I think, I think my version of that into to retail offers three layers. I think, then I think there's a bottom layer, which is time wasted, right? Don't be time wasted. I think there's a lot of retail experiences that are full with friction and which are extremely waste of time, the way that we connect and we do things, right? We need to start over. You know, we've done our research, we get into a store, no one has a clue what we're looking for. We, we go down and we explore in the store. When we come back, we can refine all the products, and, you know. So there's a lot of time wasted in how we, uh, we do business or simply just walking around in a store, looking at the bags or employees. So don't be time wasted. Then I think this next layer of time well saved. And I think, I think many companies are still stuck there, right? Trying to create that seamlessness of how we want to do business making sure that we, you know, when we've mapped out the customer journey, that we, we know how to be unique in the different touch points and create relevance. So, so me as a consumer, a shopper, I stay on the path to purchase with this brand. But the ones who really manage to do that, and I think the ones who truly brings value are the one who can also play at the top level, right? So being uh, time well spent. And I think, of course, you know, that's easy to talk about if you're at Disney or some other theme park, you know, where by default, you pay money to get an experience. 
But I think if we look at the currency of our customers being time, right? Then, then the currency of it is like, because we know if customers spend more time with us, they typically end up buying more and buying more often. That, that, if you look at a mall, we know the more time you spend in a mall, the more stores you visit. I think the latest average I saw was something by 2.67 stores per visit, right? So if I can increase that by you know, more time up to three, I build a lot of value. When you go through airports or other places of logistics and transportation, if I can get people to arrive a bit early or engage a bit more, I can manage more, but it requires that I deliver an experience that are relevant. And if you bring that down to a singular brand or experience, what is it that I kind of add at the top, which is so unique that I'm willing to spend time in having this engagement because we know it correlates with value and we know it correlates with doing that. So building these experiences and if that's in the advice, that I give to a particular product, or if it is in the usage of how we do it, or if it's simply the way that they engage with us. So, so I think a, a brand that that really is moving fast forward uh, at the moment, I think, is, is Bang & Olufsen. I, I expect big things for, for them to come up. I think they're really in, on a way to kind of redefining how they want to engage with customers. And, and when you've engaged with them, you, you also feel it. You, you, you meet, you, you know, one retailer or part of this brand who truly understands how to have a conversation and he brings you forward and he's actually able to convert you into a buying customer because he truly understands how we live, how you use sound and how you do it. And then you made a different part of this brand, which, you know, fails to do the same thing. And, and you move on and you actually end up maybe buying something that wasn't the best product or wasn't the best, but simply, you know, you left that customer journey along the way because there wasn't an element of time well spent. So I think you need to play, don't be time wasted. Make sure your time well saved and try to create these opportunities of being time well spent <clears throat> on a few select points in the customer journey. I think those, those companies will be the winners uh, going forward. Awesome, so in terms of time well spent, what, 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 what is your view? For example, creating a place where I can read a book or, I mean, of course, this is different for each a uh, specific company that we're talking about, but you know, especially yeah, I, when yeah. when we have the digital experience, uh, how how do you you know? Uh, we spoke about this. Uh, one of my clients, they 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 created this really nice piece of software where where, where they offer conversations, right? You can mm -hmm. engage uh, because well, the digital experience. I mean, a website is just a catalog if you think about it. So how do you you know? Create that online and 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 then on and offline. You know, time well spent. Yeah. What 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 are your views on this? Can you can you? Yeah, I think there are two approaches into this. So so there's the um, there's the urban outfitters approach to uh, to this, right? Where they typically create kind of unique stores where you where it's just nice to be. You're willing to kind of come spend time. Starbucks does the same thing, right? It's just a nice place to be. And and, and as I'm spending time there, I quite often also ends up putting my money there. Yeah, I think the same logic, you can apply that when, when you think about shopping malls, right? Yeah. You can talk about, am I at the shopping mall to actually get shopping done? Or am I at the shopping mall because there's just nice things to do in the shopping mall? And then I just happen to do my purchases while being there. So I think there's the element of, of doing that. And if that's adding a coffee bar or, you know, experiences into the stores is one way. I think the, the, the true part which needs to sit is where it's the experience itself. It's the experience with the brand. It is the engagements I have with the brand, with the employees, or with the logic and features of the e-commerce side that allows me to kind of stay on board. So case in point, when I go to a physical store, I'm in the market for my next piece of furniture. Am I met with a conversation about, you know, the role of this furniture? You know, why are you buying a new dining table? How many people are, you know, live in your household? You know, how do you like to spend time around your dining table? You know, am I met with a conversation where I feel I leave smarter having potentially done the right choice for me and, and hence it make up making a purchase? I think that's time well spent. I think the other element, you know, I'm in the market for, as I said, my new, uh, my new speakers. Mm -hmm. Am I met with a brand who actually are willing to spend time and come, you know, into my home, give me an experience of how that would look and how that would be set up. So I feel confident that whatever purchase is gonna follow this is gonna be relevant to me. So I think it's about curating these experience. 
Um, I mean, we talk a lot about zero-based design and implement is for if sometimes when you kind of, you, you know, you've done all the mapping, you've looked at the customer journey, you truly understand the different touch points, you, you try to understand the different needs in this, and then how would it look like if I redid the design in the best possible way, trying to deliver on all of these three elements, not being time wasted, being time well saved, and curating these moments that, that needs to define who we are as a brand and make that come across. So, so I think, I think that, that's the unique, and I think that's some of the secret sauce, being able to kind of do that work, the groundwork, and then you know, curating these experiences on top. And then of course, making sure that it doesn't just stay within the design room, but it becomes the reality of what we actually met with when you know, we're in the market. Amazing. I got two final questions. Actually, um, yeah, we're on nearly 40. It's been great, man. Very nice. So uh, one of the things that you uh, spoke about at the roundtable is the challenge of uh, dealing with partners and franchises, if you like. You know, my view is that every company today, they should have a digital policy, if you like, because if you don't have a digital policy, you know, like, uh, or a digital, what, what, what would be the other term? Policy, maybe it's not so good, but uh, alignment, like a digital alignment, because this is what's going to impact the franchisees, right? Afterwards, you need to, to communicate and to roll out this in a, in a manner. Every, some, some are going to be uh, disturbed anyhow. I mean, <laughs> but uh, how, how to solve that, that, that puzzle there, uh, Martin? What's, uh, what, what's, what are the companies or which companies do you see that are doing this in, uh, successfully here in Scandinavia? Yeah, I think I'll go with what, uh, what uh, Lars, who's the CEO of uh, Sport24 said, you know, when I asked him, they say, is there a unique kind of franchise model that can't be done? Can't be done. <laughs> Maybe I, uh, I, don't, I don't share it can't be done. I think if you look back at uh, the case of McDonald's and Ray Kroc and, you know, how he created that, you know, the whole idea of a franchise model as a fast lever to growth, Right, which was built of kind of on, on operational excellence, sitting within a commercial need. Right, so there was a commercial need for what he created at that point, the fast food, the convenience, but the franchise model was built around a commercial, you know, an operational excellence model. I think that still works. I think the challenge that we're facing today is, you know, as retail have developed, as customer needs have developed, and where we started out with a model which was just about opening stores faster through franchise. We fail to set up something that, that are driving this logic and this alignment between what we truly want to deliver and what, what's actually being experienced out there. So I foresee a, a, a number of companies that, that need to be operating in franchise today who, who need to you know, bring that model back, relook at that model, make sure it's incentivized in a different way based on you know, the role that this franchise is, is playing within the brand. You know, what is the value? What's the cost to serve? How are they working with them? Even how are they loyalty if it's a multi-brand franchisees? And then within that, and incentivize them to be true to what's the brand DNA, to be true to what's the commercial experience, to being true to all of these, which includes participating in training, you yep. know, running promotions, yep. making sure that you truly understand what it is we're trying to unfold. So I think there is an opportunity uh, to, to roll out these model and be more unique about it. Um, I also think there's a realization that you, you will never achieve the same point as you do in an own and operate, mm -hmm. which I think to some extent is also fair enough. Um, what you're trying to create, and I think based on the different brands you're trying to build, again, am I a franchisee of a big automotive brand mm -hmm. with everything set up, or am I a franchisee of a, a small print shop or something else? You know, I think it calls for two different models. I think there's a way forward, but I think it, it really, uh, again, it, it, it requires that you are defined about where the value is. For sure. I, I mean, I won't mention the a brand uh, here, but for example, I visited and, and I made a post about them on LinkedIn. And the, the, the company here had a, it, it is a franch franchisee from a bigger mother company, let's say. And, and I, I was astonished but of course, it's part of their transformation, right? That those guys who were who were franchi franchisees, 
because the mother company needs to generate demand. That's how I see it. They, they generate demand, right? They, it's a marketing company generating demand and opportunities for the franchisees. The franchisee said, I, I asked them, okay, so how is it that you're capturing the online demand eventually? Because people might be visiting the online store or catalog, and maybe you can do a sale from this place or start a conversation. So the customer can, because it's high added value products that we were talking about, right? And, and, and it's really, really interesting, like how global companies that we are talking about, they're still, they are, they are asleep at the wheel, so to speak, you know? They, so I think, I think it's coming, but um, it was interesting to see, you know, <laughs> just, uh, just to leave my five cents out there. But Martin, two final questions, and then we are over. So trends that are keeping the uh, decision makers awake at night, uh, you know, and, and we're talking a little bit about uh, that you're seeing, and then we just uh, uh, summarize with uh, your 360 degree view on, on how to win in retail today. I think we already talked about the number of trends. I think that the biggest trend whatsoever, or maybe it's just the reality right now, is convenience. So let's not spend more time on that. I think I think that's key. I think one question that's keeping companies up, and maybe even creating arguments within companies, is the ability to be relevant. And what do I mean by that? Relevant being personal enough in what we offer. You know, being able to do that. So so how deeply do we want to work with data? in order to do that and, and then avoid being creepy. <laughs> so how do we create that relevance of personal where it fits without becoming creepy? Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, I think there's a trend that we wanna we wanna do that. We wanna be more personal, but but we are also extremely fast to be vocal about when we feel someone overstepped our boundaries. So, th so I think there's a trend there which is creating a lot of uh, disturbance <laughs> um, out there. Then I think, um, again, depending on, if we look at some of the companies who are not owned and operated, but, but who owns brands, who are selling brands, I think one of the big uh, challenges uh, right out there is how do I build a branded versus private label business, right? So, so I think that whole dynamic of how do I build my assortment and how am I moving that forward, I think is a bit because you could say the dynamic and trend with the grocery retail chains is to increase private label. Whereas we know as fast moving consumer goods companies, we want to build brands in order to, get, to stay relevant. So I think there's a big point and I think that funnels all the way in to the world of, uh, of retail. And then I would probably still argue that the main challenge as such is, is the idea of Omni or, or unified commerce. So, so how does that look like? How far do I need to go down that line to actually make sure that, that our customers stay on the path to purchase, right? So. If you could talk about, you know, how much does it cost to win and sustain a customer? You know, what's my customer acquisition cost? And if you, you put that across a unified commerce environment and then having a look at that, that cost has gone up, right? So we need to make sure that we do that smart. So that doesn't mean that every opportunity and technology out there is relevant for us. So again, build a little bit back to the two by two, make distinct choices for what needs to fulfill and what technologies to explore. I think is another thing moving forward that's keeping uh, companies and CEOs awake at night. Very nice. And just to sum up this conversation, brilliant, Martin. Uh, I like to, you know, thank you very much. I learned a bunch, and I'm sure people will learn a bunch as well. Your three, your, you know, your, your, they implement 360 uh, degree views. Like the just, to, just to sum up. You, I can, I can even talk about. You say you talk about strategy, having strategy in place, then systems and process rewire and digitize the core value of your business model, balance operations and create efficiency. So maybe you can just talk about the bullet points that you see what ne what's needed in retail, and then we finalize this talk today. Yeah. So I think when it comes to, to, to strategy within retail, I, I think my key point is keep strategizing, right? Meaning that this is not a one or three year, five year process. This is something where we continuously need to think about how we explore. So just linking back to my my time back in the military and why I thought intelligence was fun was you kind of dare to throw out a hypothesis and then you were kind of collecting evidence to kind of prove or disprove that hypothesis. And strategizing is a little bit of the same thing. We need to dare to throw out a hypothesis of where growth is and then kind of, you know, have a look at where to play and how to win at a continuous basis and what needs to be true to stay there. So keep strategizing is something we work with to make these choices come alive. 
Then the other part we, which we've talked about is, I think these learning loops, or from a strategy point of view, we can call them cascading of choices. So how do we move from the ivory tower to a country into a store and into an actual experience be, you know, happening within the different channels? So your ability as a company to create those links and move decisions downwards uh, as, a, as a kind of guiding and corner flags for the next level and for them to make their decisions in order for doing that. And I think when we talk the 360, when it comes to the commercial side, there are kind of four things you need to have in place, right? You truly need to know your customers and the customer experience. You need to be relevant. So, you know, what is my value proposition? What is it and why should you come to me? What's my products? What's my services? What is it that I offer that's unique? I need to know, you know, what's my go-to-market model? I need to know which channels to engage and why. And they need to be linked with who am I trying to win and what message am I trying to convey? And then maybe the, the latter part is, have we built and developed or acquired the capabilities needed to succeed in, in these corners? So, so I think that's the commercial view of things. The operational view of things, as we talked about, is do I truly know how to manage my supply chain? Have I created transparency to my warehouses so I, I move up stock churn? So, you know, how is my push and pull effects to always make sure that I can drive fulfillment how customers want it? So you need to create that balance of commercial and operational into to, to these things. And as you talked about, a lot of that is about rewiring, right? So, so some of that is system driven, but we can, you know, the biggest excuse within any company is, you know, we're just waiting for, you know, our system landscape to be updated. So while we're waiting for that, make sure we still rewire our organization and making it capable to make decisions and balance these different things. So, so you manage to grow um, along the way. And then maybe last point, I think that maybe sits very well with Implement. I mean, we believe in empowerment, right? We, we truly believe in that a lot of what we do is still a people business, right? It's about making sure that people understand and we talked about buy into the brand and why they're working there, but also truly understanding their roles. So that whole idea of how do we create organizations that are fit for the future, fit for the markets, able to win, but also fit for human beings, because in essence, that's what it requires to be a successful company. That was brilliant. Martin Lingo, thanks so much for this. Thank you.